To the northeast of Venezuela lies the southern gate to the Caribbean. It's formed by the island nation Trinidad and Tobago, two islands that couldn't be more different. Trinidad is the larger of the two islands and has the best performing economy in the Caribbean due to its oil fields. The smaller island of the group, Tobago, lies 30 kilometres north of Trinidad. The island inspired the author Daniel Defoe to write his novel Robinson Crusoe. The novel's English hero explores the island after being left stranded on Bacolé Beach. Daniel Defoe's fictional tale is world-renowned. Defoe describes the geography and very clearly it describes the geography and describes the ecosystems and so forth. And Robinson Crusoe was shipwrecked and um, came abroad on Tobago, the island of Tobago. Oh. He didn't say Tobago, but he called it an island, Crusoe's island. But Robinson Crusoe wasn't the first person to live on Tobago. Long before he was shipwrecked there, the Caribbean islands were settled by the peaceful Arawak people. They migrated from South America to the Lesser Antilles in the first century AD, living primarily from agriculture. Between the 8th and 15th centuries, they were displaced by another group of people who also came from the jungles of Colombia and Venezuela, the Caribs. It was these people that Christopher Columbus encountered in 1498 as he landed on Trinidad during his third voyage. He named the island Bella Forma. The name Tobago is derived from tobacco, which was grown on the island. You had mainly the, 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 the Carib um, groups uh, uh, that remain here. And the Carib groups, of course, they existed when the Europeans came and continued to coexist until around, uh, around 1800, of course, and their population depleted, slowly depleted, not only because of warfare, but of um, new diseases, European diseases, I wish they were not... Um, their bodies were not um, attuned for. Fort King George towers over the island's capital, Scarborough. The Georgian-style fort was built by the British in 1770 to improve the capital's defences. It fell briefly under the control of the French, who renamed it Fort Castries after the Marquis of Castries. The British recaptured Tobago in 1793 and gave the fort its present name, in honour of the British monarch, King George III. The fort is perfectly positioned for detecting invaders, and mounting a defence against those wanting to attack from the sea. Today, Fort King George houses an historical museum that documents the long colonial history of Tobago.
Colonialism also brought cocoa to Tobago. African slaves were brought in to work the cocoa plantations under hard conditions. The ruins of cocoa factories are a reminder of the colonial era. Well, they used to put the cocoa to dry in there, slide off the roof. The roof of it used to slide off. And when they slide off, it suns the cocoa, right? In the rainy time, there was heaters inside that used to heat the cocoa because we have two weathers, rain and sun, dry and wet. And they used to make chocolate in the cocoa building. It was a cocoa industry. It was a cocoa, cocoa plantation and the building was a cocoa for making chocolate and all these stuff. Back in those days of seven, um, the 1962, 1963 days, they used to harvest the cocoa and ship it to Sweden and these places. Sugarcane is another plant that was brought to Tobago through the colonization of the Caribbean. Old, dilapidated sugarcane mills show how the plantations once operated. Sugarcane was introduced to the region by Columbus, and the Caribbean became the primary producer of sugarcane and cane sugar from the 16th century onwards. The end of the 17th century saw the adoption of the transatlantic triangular trade in which slaves were transported from the west coast of Africa to the Caribbean in exchange for European goods. The slaves were sold to plantation owners for sugar and rum and then used as cheap labour on the plantations. They were forced to work under difficult conditions until the abolition of slavery in 1834. Part of Tobago's rainforest owes its special status to the colonial rulers. The Main Ridge Forest Reserve has been protected since 1776. It's the oldest protected area of rainforest in the Western Hemisphere. The types of plants found in the Main Ridge Forest are almost exactly the same as those that grow in the Amazon Basin. This is because, geographically, the island belongs to the South American mainland. At the end of the last ice age, melting glaciers caused the sea level to rise, turning Trinidad and Tobago into islands. The land bridge to South America was flooded, leaving all the animal and plant species cut off from the mainland. The largest seabird colony is to be found on the island of Little Tobago. The ornithologist James Bond, whose name was used by the author Ian Fleming for his fictional secret agent 007, once carried out research here. In the 20th James Bond film, the secret agent travels to Cuba pretending to be an ornithologist. 
In one of the scenes, he's shown looking at a copy of the book Birds of the West Indies by the real James Bond. The author wrote some of the James Bond adventures at his house on Goat Island. The fishing villages on Tobago give the impression that time has stood still. In the morning, the locals gather on the beach to fish. Fishing with nets in Tobago is known as pulling seine. The seine net is set in the ocean by boat in a circular formation. From the beach, the Tobagonians then pull the net back toward land. For around 150 years, the inhabitants of Tobago have continued this tradition. In most beaches in Tobago that you know fishing village like Charleville, Castara, Plymouth, Black Rock, those beaches we do seen or land fishing, land seen fishing. We all come in the morning and we decide whether we're going to throw or whether we're not going to throw. Because some morning you come and you feel, well, okay, it's no sense throwing this morning. So we just look at the net, ensure it's safe, and we get back home. But like this morning, they came down and they decided to throw, so they've thrown. Small fish such as herring and tuna are captured in the net. You, for things like the mahi mahi or the dolphin, we call it mahi mahi. Okay, you go out for tuna and so on, but here we catch small fishes, okay, and we catch some large ones too. Okay, this beach is called Stonehaven Beach, and this is the only net at this time operating from this beach. Many of the locals have gathered like this on the beach to fish since their childhood. I was born just on top there, so I ran away, come down with the older folks, and it is so I got into actual fishing. You know, long ago, there weren't so many jobs offered, so most of the grown men, after working their gardens and so on, they come down on the beach, they did some fishing and so on, and the guys, they had nothing to do, you know, by way of government work and so on. So they got into fishing, but nowadays everybody has something to do, okay? okay. You're working on the URP or you're working with the government, so you have fewer guys on the beach. The younger folks, you don't have them coming. If you notice, most of the guys are pulling the net, they're aged persons, okay? Very aged. Captain Frothy prefers a more modern style of fishing. He takes his boat out to sea and then casts his lines. It's 
the main trick is, you know, to try and figure out where the fish are because most of the, like the offshore fish, they always move in. So, you know, try and figure out where they are and use the baits, the right size baits to target, you know, the sizes of the fish and the types of fish that you're going after. And, you know, try to reduce your, your chances of, of letting that fish get away, you know, make sure your equipment is good, good working order. That makes the difference of catching a fish or not catching. The waters around Trinidad and Tobago are teeming with fish due to the nutrient-rich currents of the Orinoco, which flow into the Atlantic from Venezuela just south of Tobago. Tuna, dolphin fish, king cod and marlin are among the most common fish caught in these waters. big ones that we really like to catch are blue marlin. Um, blue marlin, sailfish, white marlin, tunas, uh, dolphin fish, and wahoo. That's, that's our main offshore species. Fishing is a big job here in Tobago. There are a lot of people that you know go fishing for a living, and the local people here love to eat fish. They grew up eating fish, you know, and so fishing is a good business here. As soon as the boat returns to port, the fish are taken to market. The locals sell their wares at the market in Scarborough. Even here, time appears to pass more slowly. The stalls offer a range of local fruits and vegetables like bananas and yams, as well as meat and spices. After the day's work is finished, Tobagonians gather for some liming. Liming is the term used to describe the Tobagonian art of doing nothing. People get together, drink, play cards and tell stories and watch the day go by. The typical lime begins with two or more people meeting up and then deciding to go liming together. Liming has long been a philosophy of life on the island. Liming is after work, you come here and ease out your, your stress, your little frustration. You come by first step, have a drink. I must be one. I must be one. It's no way more he's spending. Every Sunday, the village of Baku holds its Sunday school, a huge street party featuring steel bands. The steel pan was invented in Trinidad and Tobago and has become the country's national instrument. The British colonial administration banned the locals from playing traditional African drums. As the country had a sizable oil industry, the locals began to play on discarded oil drums. The slaves, our natives, 
when they wanted to express themselves through music, somewhere down the line, someone decided to take up a piece of uh, metal and probably just start striking it and realize that, hey, by striking this metal, you could get a song. And there's where it started. The steel pan is closely identified with Calypso, the music of Trinidad and Tobago. Nowadays, all kinds of music is played on the instrument. Steel bands are made up of steel pans in a variety of different pitches. is our national instrument. The steel band signifies Trinidad and Tobago. It says a lot about the people and the attitude and how they are. And to us it's very unique and we love it. Tobagonians are extremely proud of their national instrument. They say that they've given the world a musical gift. Belonging, a sense of, um, you feel proud. For the fact that you know that this is ours. And um, you, you're sure that Anywhere through the world you go and you see a steel pan, you're going to feel proud because you know that came from Trinidad and Tobago. That's ours. Tobago is one of the most untouched islands in the Caribbean. Its long colonial history, from the time of its discovery by Christopher Columbus through the dark years of slavery, has left traces on the island that continue to influence the life and culture of the Tobagonians right up to the present day.